over the last few weeks, we've been on this series we're calling On the Road, and uh, we've been talking about the different ways that God uh, grows our trust and confidence in Him, different things that God uses in our life to make that a reality. And we began uh, the series talking about a reveal study. It was a study that was conducted over 500 churches, 180,000 participants across the country, including Hope. We took this survey, and what we discovered in this survey is this. If you're in church on a weekend, uh, you basically fall into one of four categories. You're either exploring a relationship with God. In other words, you're thinking about the idea of becoming a Christian. You're not there yet, but you're kicking the tires. You're checking it out, and we're always so glad that you're here. Or maybe you're beginning a relationship with God. In other words, you came to that place where you realized that you were lost, you needed a Savior, and you understood for the very first time that God sent His only begotten Son to this earth to be our Savior, and He died for our sins so that we could be reconciled back into a relationship with God. You've accepted that free gift of salvation, and now you're beginning that relationship with God. Those are exciting times. You may want to check out Starting Point. And then some of you are growing in your relationship with God. You are a work in progress, as we all are, right? God has begun a good work in you, and he's, he's going to be faithful to complete it. But you're, you're beginning to discover some of God's truths and principles and precepts, and as you begin to apply them to your life, you notice that there's a change, there's a transformation taking place. And then some of you, you would say you're God-centered. You've crawled up on the altar, as Paul talked about in Romans chapter 12, and you are all in. And we discussed that there's this one word that seems to move us through these four stages, and it's the word trust. In other words, as our trust in God grows, our relationship grows. As our trust in God deepens, our relationship with God deepens. Now, over the next two weekends, as we wrap up this series, this is what I want to talk about. What would life look like if you got to the God-centered stage? What would it look like? And let me just say this. All of us who've been Christians for a while... We could all give examples of a time when God began to work on a certain area of our life where he wanted us to trust him. Maybe it was something he wanted us to change, something he wanted us to do. Maybe it was something that God wanted us to give up. And when those times come, you know, regardless of which one of those circles you identify with, regardless of how mature you are as a Christian, regardless of how long you've been a Christian, when God begins to move in our lives, most of us find ourselves arguing with God. And the reason we argue is because we have a tendency to see everything in life from the perspective of what we feel like we need to be happy, what we feel like we need to be fulfilled. And so instead of just trusting God, we, we immediately begin to look at the risk that's going to be involved if we do what God wants us to do instead of what we want to do, or maybe what we think is best for our life. And what happens is, you know, we start arguing with God. And we say things like, well, God... I, I hear what you're saying, and I, and I feel like what you're asking me to do is to give up this relationship. But, but God, if I give up the relationship, you've got to understand that the risk, the risk is that I'll be alone again. Or God, I, I, I feel you moving in my life, and I feel like what you're telling me is, 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 is you, want, you want me to trust you with my finances. But God, you've got to understand, the risk is if I trust you with my finances, I might be poor again. Our God, we just went through this marriage series, and yeah, I was going to leave my marriage, but now it sounds like from a biblical perspective, I should stay in my marriage, but the risk, God, is that, you know what, I'll never be happy again. And what happens, God begins to move. We get so focused on the risk that's involved to do what God wants to do. Often what happens is, instead of obeying God, we miss out on the goodness of God. The real tragedy is this. When you say no to God, when you decide not to trust him in that moment, often for us is to walk away from the very thing that we want in our lives. For example, if I were just to ask you this morning, what do you really want out of life? What would you say? What do you really want out of life? If you're single, you might say, you know what, I want somebody who loves me unconditionally. I want to be in a relationship of mutual respect, mutual giving. I want to be in a relationship of trust. Others of you would say, you know what, I want security. Some of you would say, I want peace. Some of you would say, I want a marriage that's fulfilling. Others of you would say, I just want a family that's happy, that's committed, that's going to stay together. Understand, when we say things like that, God's response is this. That is so awesome because that's exactly what I want for you. We want the same thing. Now, here's the question. The question is, who's smarter? <laughs> who's better at getting you where you want to go? Is it you? Or is it God? Now, if I asked you, everybody raise their hand if you think God is smarter than you. Everybody here this weekend, I didn't ask you to. I said, if, if. But man, I like the way you think. You know what I'm saying? Everybody would here would raise their hand. God is smarter than me. We would say that, but deep down inside, here's the problem. We don't really believe that. 
And that's why God, when he comes alongside of us and he, and he asks us to give up a relationship that at least from his perspective, he realizes it isn't good for us. Our response is, God, I understand you know a lot about relationships, but I think I actually know more about this relationship than you do. I mean, the fact that you want me to give up this relationship tells me you don't know that much about relationships. Because if you really understood relationships and you really knew something about this relationship, God, you would leave this relationship alone. And God's like, whoa, whoa, that's not true. That's not true. It's because I know so much about relationships. I know exactly what you need to be happy. And I know that this relationship that you're in, this relationship that you're holding on to, I know that this relationship that you, that you don't want to let go, it's not going to get you where you want to go. At the end of the day, this relationship is not going to make you happy. Or, you know, maybe something like this, God, I understand you know a lot of things about a lot of stuff, but God, you obviously don't know a lot about finances and financial security. Because if you knew a lot about finances and financial security, you wouldn't ask me to tithe. You wouldn't ask me to be a person of generosity. You wouldn't ask me to give my money away. And God's response is, you know what? It's because I know so much about finances. And it's because I know so much about financial security that I ask you to do those things. You know what our problem is? I think our problem is often we just kind of see God as the, you know, this, this big party pooper in the sky who just wants to rain on our parade. He just wants to get into our lives and, you know, mess with our plans and crush our dreams. And it's because, see, we get so focused on what we want instead of what God wants for us, we forget who we're dealing with. We forget that we're dealing with a perfect heavenly father who knows more about relationships, more about family, more about finances, more about the economy. He knows more about everything than we will ever know. And because he knows us and because he loves us so much, I'm just going to warn you on this journey, the road that we're on at times, he's going to come into your life and he's going to ask you to give up something that you feel like you want. You feel like you need to hang on to if you're going to be happy, if you're going to be fulfilled in life. And so often at that moment, our response to God is no. And I just want you to know that when that happens, we forfeit that opportunity to experience the abundant life that Jesus came for us to have. What did Jesus say in John chapter 10, verse 10? I have come that they, who, who's the they? Those who follow me. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. If you have a New American Standard, it says, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus would say this, you've got it all wrong. <laughs> I didn't come to rain on your parade. I'm not some cosmic killjoy who sits up all night trying to figure out how to make you miserable. I came to give you the life that deep down inside you really want. We want the same thing. We're on the same team. But Jesus would add, in order for you to experience what you really, really want to experience in life, you're going to have to trust me. Here's the real tragedy. The things that we cling to, right, that we think are going to bring us happiness and fulfillment, the things that we don't want to let go, things like relationships and money and dreams and plans, understand, when we cling to them, they are merely substitutes for the real thing. Maybe your kid had a security blanket. Our grandkids, they didn't have security blankets. They had stuffed animals, you know, but it was their security. Olivia, she had a little bunny named Emma. Brendan came along. He had a little teddy bear named Caesar. Now we have an 18-month-old. Her name is Embry. She has a little dog. She calls Doggy. We're a little concerned about her, okay? She doesn't seem to be as advanced as the other two. But I'm telling you, there's nothing really secure about Caesar or Emma or Doggy, right? But for my grandkids, you know what? They represent security. John and Elizabeth know this. If they show up at your house without them, it could be a long night, right? Where is Emma? You know, where is Caesar? Doggy, you know. As adults, we do the very same thing. We cling to toys. We cling to relationships. We cling to finances. We cling to plans and dreams. Not because there's something in and of themselves, but they've come to represent something in our lives. They've come to represent some kind of security. They've become a substitute. Jesus says this, I've come to take away your substitutes, your stuffed animals. I've come to take away your security blankets. And in return, I'm going to give you the real thing. In return, I'm going to give you the real deal. In return, I'm going to give you what deep down inside you actually really want. But for that to happen, <laughs> you're going to have to trust me. If you have your Bible this morning, Luke chapter 5. If you don't have your Bible, we'll put the verses up on the screens. Luke chapter 5. I want us to look at a group of businessmen. We have a lot of business people here. You should relate to this. A lot of, just a group of businessmen who had to come to grips with this truth. This particular group of men, they were in the fishing business, very popular business in Jesus' day. 
These are guys who had spent time with Jesus. They had heard Jesus speak. In fact, they were present with Jesus when he performed his first miracle. They were right there in Cana when Jesus turned the water and the wine. And although they were very, very impressed, they were not impressed enough to leave everything behind and follow him, right? So one morning, these guys, they've been fishing all night, and Jesus walks into their life. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. So these guys would fish all night, and then they, they would wash their nets, and, and then they would stretch them out, and, and they would let them dry in the sun. And my guess, this is probably the worst part of their job. I mean, if you're a fisherman, you want to fish. You don't want to clean up after fishing, do you, John? Right? This is what you like to do. And they're tired. They've been fishing all night. They're exhausted. They're hungry. They just want to get home. But it says in verse 3, he, Jesus, <laughs> get this now. They're cleaning their nets. Jesus gets into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. We also know him as Peter. And he asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. By the way, Jesus does this often, and it's just because of acoustics. Jesus understood if I'm out over the water, if you've ever been by a lake in the morning, you can hear how the sound travels. Jesus got that. So he begins to teach the people. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. I'm tired of teaching. Let's go fishing. Verse 5. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. Now, that's what Peter said, but understand this is what he was really thinking. He was thinking, Jesus, you may be a pretty good carpenter. And that, water to, that wine to water thing, that was pretty spiffy. But Jesus, you don't know squat about fishing. Because if you knew anything about fishing, you would, you'd realize you fish at night with nets because at night the water's cool and the fish come close to the surface and you can catch it with not. But Jesus, I'm telling you, you're not going to catch any, any fish right now as hot as it is. It's the middle of the day. Now's not the time to go fishing. And we smile at that because we're thinking, how weird is it? How stupid are these guys to question Jesus about fishing? I mean, he created the fish, right? But the reality is when it comes to our lives, we do the exact same thing. For example... Jesus, I've read what you had to say about marriage. I get it. But have you looked at my marriage? Jesus, I understand what you have to say about giving, but have you looked at my financial situation? Do you really expect that from me? Jesus, I, I know what you have to say about forgiveness, but have you met my boss? You know, have you met my spouse? Have you met my professor? I mean, Jesus, I realize you're smart. You know a lot of things. Heck, you even created the heavens and the earth. I get that, but I, I may know more about this situation than you do. You ever said that? You ever thought that? Sure we have. But I'm really impressed with Simon, verse 5. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But I love this part. Because you say so, I will let down the nets. I think he's saying, Jesus, if it were anybody else, I'd kick him out of the boat. But since she would probably just walk on the water and crawl back in the boat, let's, let's go fishing, you know? <laughs> verse 6. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. Now, this is a fisherman's dream right here. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. See, a fisherman's thinking, what a way to go, right? Just go down with the boat and the fish. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. See, he's beginning to realize who he's in the presence of. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch men. You're going to catch people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore. Here's the two words. Left everything and followed him. Now this is what I want you to get. This is what I want you to understand. As Christians... This is God's pattern for our lives. So we invite Jesus Christ into our life and he comes in and he begins to work. <laughs> and while he's working, he gives us evidence after evidence. He gives us proof upon proof that he is trustworthy. Now I'm going to warn you, at some point this is what he's going to say. Now that I've given you the evidence and the proof that I'm trustworthy, now I want you to trust me. Now I want you to go all in. And you got to understand, at that moment, from our perspective, that is a huge risk. That is a huge gamble. See, because we know what we're giving up, but we don't know what we're going to get in return. I mean, as I listen to Carl's story, he's been a musician his whole life. He knows what he can do, but he's going to give that up to move forward in a new journey. He doesn't know what it's going to be like. 
I mean, think about it. If you look at this from Peter's perspective, think about the risk. Hey, Jesus, I haven't told you this before, but I still owe 15 payments on these boats. And I'm a fourth generation fisherman. Not only my reputation, but my family's reputation is at stake. At least Jesus tried to see it from my perspective. There, there's, this is a big gamble. There is a huge risk for me to leave all of this behind and follow you. But then again, think about it from Jesus' perspective, right? Peter, if you don't do this, think of what you're going to miss out on. I mean, Peter, people are going to name their kids after you forever. Cathedrals will be named after you. Not to mention that I'm going to use you to change the world. And in just a few years, Peter, there's going to be this thing called the Bible. It's about the life and times of Jesus and God, right? And people are going to read about, read about you and the Bible, and they're going to be encouraged by you. You're going to change the lives of people, Peter. You would be a fool not to follow you. Peter's like, oh, yeah, but look at what I'm giving up. Look at the risk. Look at what I'm leaving behind, right? Just a different perspective. And it's because when God asks us to trust him, the only thing we're really sure of is what we have. The only thing we're really sure of is what's in our hand. The only thing we're really sure of is what we think we need to be happy, what we think we need to be fulfilled. And God's kind of like a coach standing on the sidelines going, but just trust me. Just trust me. Just trust me because I will never take anything from you that I will not replace with something so much better. In fact, if you'll just trust me, if you'll just do what I'm asking you to do, you're going to look back one day and say, I can't believe I almost missed that. I'll be honest with you. As I think back on the times in my life that God asked me to trust him and to let go of something that I really, really wanted to hang on to, you look back, 2020 perspective, right? No big sacrifice. Now, don't get me wrong. In the middle of it, I mean, it was everything. It was my whole life. But now I look back and think, shoot. That wasn't a sacrifice. That was the best move I ever made in my life. That was a no-brainer looking back, looking back. Man, we had a phenomenal time in Watoto last week in Uganda. Watoto Church, think about this, 24,000 people in Kampala, Uganda, spread out over several campuses. I got to speak at all the services last week, and Saturday night services full and overflowing. Now, on Sunday, I, you know, I realized I'd never spoken four times in one day before, but their service times were 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, noon, and 2 in the afternoon. Well, I'm used to you hope people, so I'm thinking nobody's coming to church at 8 o'clock in the morning, right? Full and overflowing, people sitting outside. 10 o'clock, full and overflowing, people sitting outside. 12 o'clock, well, no, that's lunchtime. Full and overflowing, people sitting outside. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, hot, no air conditioning in this building, full and overflowing, people sitting outside. You know what my, my thought was? Wow, I think they love Jesus more than we do. That, I'll be honest, that was my thought, right? <laughs> now think about this. Up in Laminadera, where we built the worship center in the, in the orphan village there, there are only 545 orphans in the village. But when we built that worship center, it was, wasn't just for the orphan village. It was for the community to also come on the weekends. They only have 545 children in the orphan village, but every weekend they have 2,000 children. Is that amazing? In this, this, this little church that you guys sacrificed so that we could build. But while we were there on Monday after speaking, we, we, on Monday we went up to the northern part of the country. We went up to Gulu, and you pr probably heard the, the story or you saw the movies about the invisible children. And this is where Coney and his army, they would, they would come and they would raid houses at night. And they would take the children and they would turn them into child soldiers. And we've met children who once the soldiers took them, they had to stand in front of their family and shoot and kill their family so that they would have no one to return home to. These girls were taken. These girls raped over and over again. Many of them, their noses were cut off, their lips were cut off, so they, they wouldn't even want to go back into society. And Gary, he's the pastor of Watoto, founded the church 10 years, 10 years before Hope, Easter of 1984. His wife, Marilyn, one day God began to move in their spirit about these women, the, these, these, the, the, these outcasts of society, because now the war's over. And there's no place for them in society. Communities don't want them back. They know you killed your family. Forced to or not, you killed your family. They came back with all these illegitimate children because they've been raped by these soldiers. We don't want you in our community. So they took the risk of going up to the northern part of Uganda, which was still a very unstable place. And they said, we're going to minister to these women. And they started, they started a thing called Living Hope. 2,000 women have gone through this. 900 more on the waiting list right now. These were, women, these were girl soldiers. They brought in plastic surgeons. Many of them, their noses and lips have been restored. 
But they're introducing them into a relationship with Jesus Christ and restoring their dignity. They teach them how to write English, how to speak it. They teach them a trade. When we were there, we were watching them make peanut butter. If you've been here when the Watoto Choir comes, the little stuffed animals and dolls that you buy, these ladies are making them. They're learning how to have a craft so they can go back in the community and they can realize that we are beautifully and wonderfully made by God. And as I heard some of these women tell their stories, it blew my mind. And later, as I was walking to the car with Gary, I said, you must be so proud to be involved in something like this. He said, Mike, biggest no-brainer in the world. Looking back. Looking back, right? But do you understand what he would have missed if he would have played it safe? In the very same way, I guarantee you that as Peter, James, and John look down at us this weekend from heaven, I guarantee you they don't consider leaving their boats and nets on the shore a sacrifice. My guess is from their perspective, it was just a good deal. From their perspective, it was just a no-brainer. And it's because here's the principle. God will never take anything from us that he doesn't replace with something better. He'll never take anything. He will never ask anything of us that he doesn't replace with something better. See, here's the issue. The issue isn't what's in your hand. The issue is always this. At the end of the day, it's always this. It's not what you have. It's not what God is asking for. The issue is always, is God trustworthy? Can I trust him? By the way, I hear stories every week of Christians who spent most of their life Wrestling with God over the little things, the substitutes in their life, the toys, the relationships, the money, the dreams. And they're absolutely worn out because they have, they just wasted all of those years pursuing substitutes, things they thought they wanted, things they thought they needed to be happy. But now I get the email or I have the conversation. They finally came to the place where they're ready to say, God, I, I don't want a substitute anymore. I want the real thing. And I know that God is loving, I know he's patient, I know he's kind, I know all that. But when he hears that, he must think, that is so awesome. But why did it take you so long to get here? Why have you been chasing your tail for 10, 15, 20 years? Why didn't you just trust me from day one? Because if you would have trusted me from day one, can you imagine what your life would look like now? By the way, the longer you wait, the harder it is. I'll just warn you, the older and more established you are, <laughs> the harder it is to trust. Because now all of a sudden you got something, right? And there's more risk involved. But think about it, when you're younger, you're like, like, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll give whatever you want me to get. I got nothing. What do you want? What do you want? Right. By the way, it's true with churches. When churches are small, we just walk by faith. We just trust God for everything because we don't have anything. And then all of a sudden you get something. I'm telling you, when Mr. Martin gave us this piece of property, he was, he was here this weekend. When he, when he gave us this piece of property, we were so excited. We celebrated, and then reality hit. We can't afford to build anything on that property. And I found some Christian businessmen in Indiana. He had more faith in us than we had in ourselves. And we're like, hey, we want to build this building that's $11 million. <laughs> they just... Okay. And they said, you know you can't afford it, don't you? You know you can't afford the mortgage? You can't even afford to turn the lights on? But we feel like God wants us to build it. And they're like, all right. And so we met in the gym next door. Best years of hope. Three years. We grew at a rate of about 30 to 35% every year. And while this building was going up, God was putting the people together, bringing them into his kingdom who began to give and sacrifice so that when we picked up all of our chairs on the last day and moved into this building, we could afford it. We could turn the lights on. We've never missed a mortgage payment. You can't do that anymore. Are you kidding me? If I went to our boards, man, metrics, spreadsheets, Debt ratios. I didn't even know what a debt ratio was when we built this building. I just recently found out, because some of you were complaining about debt ratio, what a debt ratio is. And our debt ratio is about 102%. What your debt ratio is, take your annual budget, which is, I don't know, $15 million, and our debt ratio is about $15 million, which is pretty, pretty rational, to be honest with you. <laughs> when we built this building, now looking back, 
it was about 350 to 400% debt ratio. That's awesome. I didn't even know. Nothing to be afraid of because I didn't know. Ignorance is bliss, right? <laughs> By the way, I, will, I do hope you'll be here tonight for our vision night. We're going to dream together. We're going to talk about the future, our 2020 vision. We're going to talk about how it's going to affect every one of our campuses. We're going to talk about where God is leading us to open brand new campuses because our goal is to have a campus everywhere in the triangle where no one is further than 20 minutes from a campus. We're going to talk about, we got to, we got to get, this is the elephant in the room. What does hope look like after I'm gone? I hope to be here 40 more years, but who knows, you know. People ask me all the time, what's your plan? What if you get hit by a bus? That's stupid. <laughs> Just don't walk out in front of a bus. I mean, how's Well, we got to talk about it, you know. I mean, you, are you just going to hire another guy and, and everybody's going to be watching him on a video? Or will each campus have its own gifted teaching pastor, you know? Will we be one church or will we be eight, nine, ten churches under one umbrella, under one senior leader working together to fulfill our mission of reaching the triangle change of the world? I know what God's put on my heart, and I'm going to say more about it this evening. But I'm gonna, this is why I said, when you have that kind of conversation... It can be scary for some people. It can be risky because there's a lot of unknowns. But I'm going to be honest with you. I have never been more at peace in my life about the future of Hope Community Church. I've never been more excited because I know that when we trust God, because see, here's the track record I've had here with 20 years. I know that when we trust God, he shows up and we experience his faithfulness. And as we experience his faithfulness, our confidence and trust grows. I think the next chapter of Hope, Hope 2.0, whatever you want to call it, it's going to be the best years ever. But I'll tell you this, it won't happen by playing it safe. You know what God says? I think he says this. If I'm trustworthy when you have nothing, I'm still trustworthy when you have a lot. If I'm trustworthy when you have $40, I'm trustworthy when you have $40 million. You see, the issue isn't the value of what's in your hand. Always the same. What God is calling you to, is he trustworthy? Is he going to pay for what he orders? And if God is trustworthy, see, it doesn't matter what he asks. If God is trustworthy, it doesn't matter what he wants us to do. But God, this is the best relationship I've ever had. Yeah, I know, but I know more about relationships than you do. Just trust me. But God, this is about my financial security. Yeah, I know all about your financial security. Just trust me. I mean, think about this. Just like the disciples, this is the part I love about this story. We see them in action every day. I mean, just walk outside. You know what you'll be reminded of? We live on a big ball of dirt hanging in the middle of nowhere. Now, I, I told you guys I was a PE major, but I was also a science minor. I'm a little bit smarter than you guys think I am. Do you know if we were just a few miles closer to the sun, we would burn up like an ant under a magnifying glass. A few miles further away, we'd be like the frozen tundra right? And not only that, we're on this ball of dirt that rotates once every 24 hours. Not a one of you got up this morning saying, well, what if the sun came up? Not a one of you ran outside and said, ooh, there's that big ball of fire. I guess I'll get dressed to go to church. Nobody has to do that, right? You know why? Because every day we see him in action. Every day we see the sun come up and see it said, ah, he's trustworthy, right on schedule. We've seen it over and over again. So he says, I am faithful you got to trust me. So here's my question. What area in your life is God asking you to trust him? And from your perspective, it may seem risky to say yes, but I'm going to tell you, based on experience, it is far riskier to say no. Because you got to understand, you have a loving, heavenly father who has your best interest in mind. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell it short. To be obedient and follow him, it will cost you. But not to obey and follow, it's going to cost you a lot more. So would you be wise enough to say, God, I, I'm going to take my focus off of what's in my hand. And for a change, God, you know what? I'm just going to focus on your character. I'm going to focus on your faithfulness. I'm going to focus on your track record. I, I'm going to be like the disciples. I've seen enough proof. I've, you've given me enough evidence. I am going to trust you. Now, here's what happens. When you make that decision, see, your fear intersects with God's faithfulness. And you're going to experience God like never before. 
And what you're going to discover is that there's a whole new world out there. There's a whole new adventure that God has designed specifically for you. But you know what? You will never experience it until you actually trust him. Let's bow. So what's in your hand? (laughs) What's your security blanket? Is it your money? Is it your time? Is it a relationship? Is it your career? Whether you have a little, whether you have a lot, it's not the issue. The issue is, is God trustworthy? Father, build us into people of faith. Create in us a heart that says, if he calls me out of the boat, I'm getting out of the boat. And and Father, it's it's so important that it's coming from you because this is not about what we want to do. This is about what you've called us to do. And when you tell us to leave behind our boats and our net, because this is where you're taking us, build us in the people who have such trust and confidence in you that we just follow. Father, allow us to do something so great for you, not for us. Allow us to do something so great for you. It is doomed for failure if you're not in it. It is doomed to fail if you don't show up. But Father, we look back over the 20 years of this church and you have shown up time and time and time and time and time again. Give us the courage to say we've seen the proof. We've seen the evidence. He is trustworthy. He is faithful. He is dependable. We will follow. And as individuals, Father, (laughs) there are people here sitting right now that you're trying to, to call into things that will one day when they look back, it will blow their minds. But they're in danger of missing it all because of their lack of trust. Just remind us every day that you are trustworthy. It's not what we have. It's not the risk. The issue is, are you trustworthy? Build us into people who have that kind of faith. In your name we pray. Amen.